Hello, and welcome to Fails, Falls, and Fuck-Ups. Now, this week is a little bit of a departure. Normally, we've been talking to actors and musicians. But today, we've got on, he's still a creative, he's still a bit of a visionary. But instead of painting with paints, this is a man who paints with water and colors and sometimes even fire. This is a man who asked the question, how do I make water cry? with emotion. And hopefully I'll bring him to tears. Mark Fuller, thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? Fine, Bruce. And I just realized, you know, your show has three F's in it. And I guess, Fuller, I'm the fourth. I hope by the end of this show, we won't decide that that's not just the only thing I have in common with the other three. <laughs> hopefully by the end of the show, we will have made Fuller the new fuck. <laughs> I don't normally lay out a, a bit of a biography to start because I just want to just get into the mistakes because to say you're successful is a little bit of an understatement. You effectively pioneered, not that fountains didn't exist before, but very few people took them to the extreme, to the majesty that you have. And now that I'm done buttering you up, <laughs> tell us a little bit about who you are now and how you got there. Well, my company is WET, W-E-T, which uh, in the old days, just like KFC stood for something else, it stood for Water Entertainment Technologies. Because when I, I grabbed a couple of friends, we all had worked at Disney at what's now Walt Disney Imagineering for several years during the Epcot era. And I did a couple of fountains for them at Epcot. Well, one in particular, maybe some of your viewers have seen it. It's the Leapfrog Fountain with those clear glass-like streams of water dance around and right over people's heads. And that came out of the, my thesis project when I was in the university. And I just, we did that. And the phone started ringing after Epcot with developers and architects and so forth around saying, we're doing a project and we haven't seen anything that looks like a, an original fountain since, you know, sort of the last Roman died, I guess, <laughs> stone horses and water coming out of their mouths. And I, you know, I thought, gosh, we're at Disney and it's all about animating inanimate objects and drawings. Why don't we just, pursue this. I think nobody else is doing it. And that was 39 years ago. We're still squirting. <laughs> and he caught me with, we're still squirting. <laughs> <laughs> Being in an industry that is so divorced from what most people would have a like personal reference to, everyone would see it and see it's beautiful, but nobody understands the the sausage making of it, unlike being in IT or being in real estate or even if being in normal engineering. Are there some unique challenges to what you do that's, that poses risk and issues that somebody else wouldn't encounter? And if so, what are those? Well, that's a really interesting question. I, I, an old friend of mine stopped by, uh, actually just yesterday, who was also at uh, WDI when I was there. And we were talking about all the people that we had known that had worked for Disney over the years. And, and a lot of them have gone out and launched their own, you know, sort of spinoff companies. And I think what's unique uh, about what, what we've done here at WET is, I mean, I mean, someone is really good at something, let's say, sound equipment at Disney. <clears throat> and then when I, one of my good friends actually gone out and gone into the digital sound manufacturing business and things like that. But what we've created here at WET is actually like a mini or micro mini Walt Disney Imagineering in that we have so many different disciplines here and we bring them together to create a whole experience. Uh, I mean, I, I used to laugh and think, I used to think thumbing through a college catalog, which you don't do anymore, but you did in, the, in my paper days. And I don't know if you could find a discipline that we don't have or, or haven't had here. Everything from astronauts to archaeologists to uh, pattern designers to physicists, scientists, animators, and so forth. And the fun to me really is that mixing of people. This is one place that working from home don't work <laughs> uh, because it, 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 the good stuff just comes by sitting down at lunch with, let's well, say you've got a textile designer having lunch with an optical engineer and, and you talk, they're talking about light and patterns and one thing and another. I never thought of that before. And those two people would probably never have spoken to each other in any other aspect of life. So the challenge is just to keep, keep the soup stirred. You, you know, the only thing settled at the bottom. And I guess that's what I walk around doing most of my day. Since you were at one point a hands-on engineer, what has it been like to transition out of being 
or I'm, I'm assuming that you have transitioned more from being the guy in the trenches designing to the big idea guy, but having come out of engineering, was that a difficult trans transition for you? Yeah, that's a good point. It was, and to some degree still is. Uh, I mean, I do, if we're stuck on something, I do tend to, to jump down in the mud. And I, I guess that's good because I understand the problem. I, I'm not with anywhere near the current, you know, technology understanding that the, that may be there. But but in a sense, I I, I kind of the, the big picture view, um, and I'm more comfortable doing that and getting involved in doing what I guess people would consider typical management stuff. So you've got to wear both the businessman hat, the engineer hat, the artistic director hat. Which hat do you prefer and which is your least favorite? Well, let me, let me tell you something before I answer that. Um, a very dear friend of mine, we went to Stanford at about the same time David Kelly um, founded uh, IDEO, which is one of the, I guess it's the biggest design company in, on earth. Now they design fantastic products and so forth. In fact, he actually was hired by Steve Jobs to develop the first mouse. But if you see one of his TED Talks, and I think he's done a couple, he said, they always tell you in business school, whatever you do, you got to learn to draw the line between your employees and your friends. And David said, you know, I just didn't want to do that. I wanted to get some friends together and work with them too. And I thought, by golly, if David can do it, so can I. So we're, we wouldn't call it a family because we're not blood relations and, and we're not a team and that we're not athletically competing, but, but it's a group of people. And there's a lot of people here who've worked here 25 plus years, and, along with a lot of new blood, which keeps it interesting. But that gives us the ability to work with a very loose org chart and kind of know what somebody, you know, down the hall is going to do with our idea and that type of thing. Um, it's, it's a little loosey-goosey that way, in a sense. Um, uh, but I, I think it's more fun for us, and that translates into a greater likelihood of us coming up with something kind of wild and crazy that'll be fun for the public, too. True, but I'm not letting you get out of this question. I'll try again. The question is... As you, the part-time artistic director, part-time engineer, part-time businessman, this is the three roles that I assume, there might be 18 more, but these are the three main roles that I assume that you have at your company. Which of these hats, the businessman, the businessman, the artistic director, the engineer, which of these three hats is your favorite and why? Which of these three hats are your least favorite and why as well? Least favorite by far is the business role. Most favorite is the, is the more big picture role, like thinking, what, what are we trying to accomplish? What's the story? I guess you could say in a sense, if you were thinking of what we're doing as a dimensional participatory movie that will get people, I think you used the word cry uh, in some context when we started chatting. What will get people to cry? I always talk about crying. I actually, uh, I actually do look when I go to the Bellagio, uh, which I've been there many times. I this sounds so corny, but it's true. I'll turn around watching the fountains. I know what they're going to do, and I'll, I'll, I'll look and very often see moisture in, in people's eyes. There's something about the being just caught up in that experience that brings tears to people's eyes in a, in a good way, and I love that. It's been a long time since I've saw them, but those fountains at the Bellagio are. I mean, it's hard to even put it into words how spectacular they look. And again, it's rare to be able to talk to somebody who creates, I don't want to call it spectacle. It is spectacle, but that's almost the wrong word because it makes it sound like a Roman gladiatorial <laughs> combat thing. But the energy and, and the beauty of, of a thing, it's so rare. And on the topic of rare, do you have a white whale? Is there a concept, a dream? Is there something that's been in your mind that you've been trying to create that as yet, it's still eluding you the pieces. And if so, what is it if you could talk about it, but if you can't talk about it or not inclined to, how do you deal with having this elusive thing? <sighs> Some good questions. Um, in, in a general sense, the, the, the white whale, the thing we're trying to do is just look at what are the current constraints that you just take for granted. Like, okay. Fountains. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means you're just going to squirt water and it's going to come out of pipes. You got to dig holes and get pumps and stuff. So what would be the rules we could break? Well, suppose the fountains weren't powered by water 
or suppose they weren't fixed to the ground. I get the biggest kick out. People uh, sort of uh, refer to the fountains of Bellagio. Oh, dancing fountains. Well, think about it. suppose suppose you took Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers and said, "No, we want you to do two beautiful dances, but your feet are going to be screwed to the dance floor, your shoes, so you can do all this, but you can't move your feet." I don't think they'd feel it. That's dancing, and yet every fountain on earth is hooked to the pipes in the bottom of the lake or, or underground, so, so it's limited. Well, I won't say much more than that, other than very soon we're breaking that rule, and we will have dancers and effectively like ice skaters on, on the lake, I mean, with those degrees of freedom. So that's not easy, and that's a very exciting thing, and it's been in the back of my mind for many years, and we found a client who just got totally excited about it, and that's, that's one of the big projects we're involved in now. Do you find that what you need to do when you have these grand ideas that you've got to find the right client for it is because I think a lot of um, businesses, it's client has need, you fill need, but it sounds like it's a little reversed in your, your case where it's like, I have this idea. I need to find the money guy. I can get really excited about it. You know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a meeting in the middle of, of the bridge over the river. I, for instance, you know, you just congratulated me on the, on the fountains of Bellagio, but, but Steve Wynn had that vision and he had the money to, to execute it. But he, when he first, he took my wife and I to dinner and he said, Mark, there's just several goals I have here. When people see what we're creating out there, I want them to forget entirely where they are, that they're in Las Vegas. I want no signs of that around. No, that's why it's not, it's not full of flashing color, for instance. And I want it to be romantic. Um, and then he said, and I, and I want it to be the biggest and best thing you've ever done in your life. I might have broken that last one a couple of times because we always go on to, to try to hit higher things. But without Steve and his belief and, and starting off and we were guessing at the budget and, and we spent a bunch more than he originally planned on it. Um, but then he said on opening day, Mark, there's a thousand rooms to look down this fountain. I'm going to raise the price on each one 50 bucks. Well, you take. It's more than that now, but you take a thousand times fifty dollars times three hundred sixty-five days times twenty-two years. How many times? Is that, how many hundred times has that fountain paid for itself? So he had that vision as a businessman, but not starting with a spreadsheet and calculating ROI. Just thinking, if I give something great to the public, uh, it will pay off. If you go and stand at the balustrade by the fountains of Bellagio, you can turn to your right, and you might be standing next to Rupert Murdoch, and you can turn to your left, and you might be standing next to a homeless person. Both people have paid the same price to see what would, in today's dollars, be at least two, three hundred million dollar show. That's pretty neat to me. Uh, so our business model is that we bring huge crowds of people, and they see these spectacular shows for free, and yet we make a ton of money for our clients because our clients are, are generally visionaries themselves, and they know if we get the people there, and I can pull them in, and and then they'll they'll stay, they'll, they'll go to the gaming tables, or stay a night, or have a wonderful meal. When I was a kid and, and you could see TV through the airwaves, you know, adjust the rabbit ears on top of the set or something, that was free entertainment. I mean, you paid the price of suffering through the commercials, but nothing monetary. Now you got to pay for your cable. Is there anything, is there any other free entertainment on earth? I can't think of it. So I think we're, we've created something special in that sense. Absolutely. You have, and it very, I keep saying it's an incredibly unique thing. So when you're dealing with somebody like Steve Wynn or one of these clients, how mistake tolerant are they? Um, you mean, did Steve ever yell at me? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> have I been fired a couple of times and then dragged back into the room? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you, you know, that you don't get to where people like that are. I mean, you think of the famous, you know, Steve Jobs. Uh, what was it? How you got to hold the phone a certain way to not block the microphone. Uh, I, I think part of conquering new barriers or climbing to new heights is, is making mistakes and just saying, okay, let's dust off, uh, go home and sulk tonight or something and come back tomorrow and say, we're going to, we're going to keep going forward. Um, and that's, that's, that's what we've always done. I, I should think about this. I'm not trying to break. I don't think we've ever failed. Uh, in the end, we, we've lost a lot of innings, but, but always in the ninth, you know, or extra innings or something we make a rounding success out of it. It's just, it's just, just cause we work hard. I mean, we're hard to kill. We, we keep coming back at it. I think there's lessons to be had there. So 
in your estimation, if you could be honest with yourself, looking back, what would you say was your biggest mistake? Not just as a company, but as an individual, something that was fundamental to you becoming who you eventually became. Well, this is a little tangential to that, but it's, it's poignant to me at the moment. So I mentioned it. Not, not the biggest mistake, but the biggest price. I will, I will confess I paid a price with, uh, I mean, to, to run a, a creative company like this, you spent a lot of time there. And I think it's taken a toll on my family. And I, sometimes I look back and think, could I, could I have, what, should I have mediated that some? And I, and I, I, I do feel, um, I, I do feel that. Uh, it just, you just, you can't uh, climb some of the hills you have to climb over and be home for five o'clock at dinner every night and so forth. At least I, I couldn't find a way. In. So that, that was a, that was a hard path for, for me to go on. In recent years, have you been able to rebuild some of those bridges, make amends, however you want to phrase it? Have you been able to rebuild some of that lost moments with your family? Um, yes, but not to the degree, uh, that I, I probably wish I could, you know, I, we, I saw a little film clip when I worked at Disney. I don't, they don't show it to the public at all. It's in black and white uh, for two reasons. It's Walt Disney and he's smoking and they never showed that uh, in public, right. but of course that that's what took his life. Uh, but one of the interviewers is asking him about his family and, and did he have any brothers? And of course, Roy was his, his partner out in here, but he said, yes, I had another brother who stayed back in the Midwest. What did he do for his life? He was a postman. And then with a very wistful look, Walt says, I think maybe he was the smart one in the family. Because, you know, Walt, Walt uh, he was another workaholic and stressed out. And uh, I'm sure he smoked himself to death uh, as a, probably a, under the stress and tension of that. And he had his ups and downs, you know. I mean, make a ton of money on Snow White and then hit the bottom. And then Mary Poppins is back until he, stability came about when they opened the parks. It's, it takes its toll. Aside from the family thing, the mistake. Well, there, there wasn't, there wasn't one of them. I made it. I could tell you a bunch of crazy stories of, about what from Disney on to the present about things that I, I think I have an ability to judge what seems like it probably can't be done, but I've got a feeling no, it, it can, uh, and, and we can go there. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, stupid enough to jump off of a tall building without a parachute. I, I can usually tell God, that just can't be done. But, but there are things you think, no, we're going to try and we're going to try. And there's not just one path to go down. And, uh, if that doesn't work, we'll, we'll do something else. And, and one of the things we do here a lot, and I learned this at, at working for uh, Walt Disney Imagineering is an incredible amount of mocking things up. I mean, tiny things and then full half scale, full scale, big, almost like motion picture set replicas of fountains and something we'll get a client then that uh, one of the answers i or questions i i find a little bit naive they'll say well if you're so good you're the expert why do you have to mock it up don't you know what you're doing and, and my reply is yes i'm an expert and that's why i mock things up um because you if you're charting new grounds you just have to try incrementally and change and and, and move down the path and it and the same thing's true today. You know, we're we're looking at each other. We're not anywhere near each other, but we're we're doing it um, visually. And so much of creativity is moved to the screen. And we still, I mean, we gosh, we use software. I can't believe three uh, D modeling and all that stuff. But we still build physical models, and we still build physical things. And sometimes when we're interviewing a young person, they'll say, well, this is old fashioned. I mean, I can in, in Rhino or whatever it is, I can I can model anything you can imagine photorealistically mark on a computer screen. Why are we carving and making models? And, and I said to, to a young fellow the other day, I said, can you can you model a lightsaber? Oh, yeah, I can model a lightsaber. Like I said, uh, will it look real? Oh, it looks so real. I said, will it work? Oh, yeah, it'll totally work. I said, OK. It'll work on the screen. It won't work in real life. I don't want you building anything like that for me. It works on the screen, but it can't be built in real life. And that's what, you know, computers can do. They, they are the most proficient liars in our lives. They can tell us things that absolutely will believe and cannot be done. And so you have to cross that bridge into reality. It's fun. It's physical. So I'm assuming from that you use computers on a design phase, but at that point, 
You need to get it into the real world because you're dealing with, especially what you're doing, you're dealing with like fluid dynamics, you're dealing with physics and you can model them and you can run simulations, but they still aren't the actual physical world. Yeah. And they're really close. I mean, some of the CGI stuff, I, and I love it. Uh, it's, it's so exciting to see how like in, in, uh, a, you know, in a, in a first person shooter game on TV or something, you, you feel like you're really running through, you know, a town or the jungle or something. It's, it's modeling and in, in real rendering and in, in real time. And it, that's just amazing, but it, it's not, it's not the same experience. I don't care how good it is. And I don't think it'll ever be as being physically there. I think we've got, I don't pick your number, a hundred thousand or more years of, of sensorial perception built into us, not just our eyes, ears, and nose of, liking things that are real and responding to them in that way. And I think it'll take another hundred thousand years to where we get the same joy out of just a virtual image. I have to say when I'm watching, I don't play that much in video games, but I do have an affinity for the fallout series and I love the aesthetic of the world. However, if I'm, I'm prevented from being too engrossed in it because the physics are a little bit off. They're good but they're not real. It's almost like the uncanny Valley thing where you can see 3d animation. And if it's not cartoon, like, and they're trying to get photorealistic, there's still a little something where you're like, ah, that's not real. And it's supposed to look human. And it still scratches at the back of the brain. Yeah. And, and there's little touches uh, where the real gets you. We, we finished for the, for the uh, Dubai expo, one of the biggest exposition, uh, what they now call world's fairs in, in, in the history of the world. I think that it, was open last year in Dubai and we did the, the central water feature there. And it was, we used a whole bunch of, uh, including visual media and water and, and music. And was that the one with the fire? Fire, hydrogen fire covered in the middle and these massive waves to the, to synchronize with an orchestral composition come crashing down. And I decided when we did the mock up here, what are we going to do with this water? We put a drainage thing around or whatever. And so the, the wall was built of all these little little stones, you know, grouted together and the waves tumble down. I said, let's just leave the grout out of like the last couple of meters at the bottom and let the water disappear. And that was one of the most popular things there. The kids and the adults, they stand there and they think they're going to get either ruin their shoes or get washed away. And the water just seemingly disappears into the ground. Little tiny touch. I don't think if you modeled it on the computer, anybody would say, well, what's the big deal about that? But when you're there, that visceral effect of a big wave, this tall coming and just literally magically disappearing into the earth. Uh, it was, it's one of the most talked about things in the whole feature. Now, out of curiosity, was that, that was your idea or did an engineer bring it to you? Uh, uh, the, the taking the grout out was my idea. I, I mean, we, we looked at a lot of things. One of our ideas was, well, why don't we just let the water come in? And, and the, when you come into this plaza, you, somebody might warn you, but you're going to be standing in this much water at the end of the day. We'll just, it's a barefoot plaza. We'll just surprise people by, by not letting the water disappear or, and then the opposite extreme would be the more boring one, which you put it like a slot drain, like you see at the side of the road around there, or we tone the waves down and they don't come out that much. Da, 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 da. And we just, we had to build a whole bunch of mock-ups, big waves, the curve of the wall. How can we get them to disappear just at, at your footsteps? Um, and then, then <laughs> what really was fun on that one, there's no, there's no handrail there. So you've got these, these huge walls. That, and we're talking, what, what are they, 60, 70 feet high or something at the top? These massive waves comes down. And we didn't want to put a handrail there. And so uh, we thought people would stand there, get their toes wet. Kids would start to climb those. Which you cannot believe it. A little bitty kid, those little feet and fingers and toes, they could go up pretty high. Now, if you, if you lose your grip, you just kind of roll down the wall in, in the water. But the security guards there, uh, I mean, they went. Or they thought, oh, we're going to be lost, this, that, and the other. So the first few weeks, I just was going around telling the security guys, it's in the plant. It's safe. We test. And they, they finally backed off. And, and so if you see videos of it, the, 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 at least as many people are in the water letting themselves get washed back down that wall as they're just standing watching. As a designer that you are, is something like that, is, is that wall, that way of dissipating your the trick you're most proud of what is the trick that you've pulled off that you are most proud of of all of your creations i will say it is that feature <clears throat> and I, i'll tell you why if and you can see it on youtube if anybody who has, hasn't been there but it's, it's hugely massive it's it's like going into kind of a coliseum and you go down these stairs 
and, and these walls around you. And, and meter wide, we have 150 meter pieces that, are, that make the circumference. And each one of those will put forth a little wave or a big, huge gush of water. So it's like a, think of a circular piano that you can play. You can hit the keys hard, big wave or soft. And then we, we joined with uh, Ramin Javadi, the mu brilliant musical composer, probably the number one composer in Hollywood, I suppose. He, he did the, all the music for Game of Thrones, for Iron Man, for Westworld. Everything you work out to. Yeah, everything we work out to. <laughs> yeah, man, he's, a, he's also a wonderful human being. Yesterday was his birthday. Well, happy birthday. He composed a, a, an entire score of pieces for that, which we had uh, recorded at Abbey Road in London with that live orchestra. And it was great fun. Um, so, so we had this great music and an incredible sound system there with, I think it's the world's largest subwoofer. It's about the size of, of a very large hot tub in the middle and other speakers around the edge. Yeah, but then what we did was you see these waves and they come crashing down. But then I, I'm not going to give you the secret. Here. It's a touch of magic, actually. But when you watch those waves, they'll come crashing to the bottom and then they'll slow down and the next waves will fall a little slower and then they'll freeze and they'll go right up the wall. And you can be as close to that wall, Bruce, as I am to this screen. And you would swear that that wave is reversed and climbing the wall. And it's pretty hard to figure out how it happens. And it's it's pretty thrilling to see. I definitely want to see that myself. So I'm now going to ask you a couple questions for, to give a little lessons to people who might be listening. As somebody who hires, well, let's say the best of the best, because it takes a very specific sort of imagination and mind to contribute to what you build. As a boss, as a man who has interviewed tons of people for work, what do you look for in an employee? What are your red flags on people that make you go, resume is great, but no? The number one, and I, I don't know if I could articulate the signpost of this, but the number one thing I look for is curiosity. If I, I, I'll, I'll walk somebody around, if I, I can't remember if, I, if I've walked you through our whole campus here or not, nope. but we'll, we'll have to do it sometime. We have fantastic machine shops, model shops, and so forth. And what I look for on that interview, we're just talking, I'm describing stuff, but, but some people, what does this do? How could you do this? And other people, I, I could be walking them through a salt mine or down, down the aisle at Ralph's or something. And we're having a fine conversation, but they're not curious. They're, they're not, their eyes are not reaching out and looking for things to try to, to digest. So usually at the end of that walk, I've made a, a large part of the decision. I mean, they have to be technically competent. I, I'd say what we look for. What most people, when they interview, they say, ah, oh, well, we're looking for experience and we're looking for knowledge, right? Those, those are things that are the normal, the normal things. You have to look for curiosity and, and I'll couple that with smartness. Okay. And uh, you, uh, you got that. And then you've got knowledge and you've got experience and then you've got uh, commitment, right? Enthusiasm and commitment. The only one of those things that you can change after you've hired them is experience and knowledge. You can teach them when they're going to get experience. You can't make them smarter. You can't make them more experienced. And you're not going to build passion if it's not there. So I think the world tends to hire on the only things that are fixable. <laughs> and they're stuck with whatever they, the others that walk through the door. So we really try to break that paradigm. And now for the thing that occurs and you're sort of like, yep, nope, right away. What is, what is the big red flag? A big red flag is uh, where, where, where the, the, the candidate immediately turns to, well, let's see, do you, have a, a, do you have a 401k? Can I work from home a couple of days out of the week? And it's ironic because I was just talking about spending time with your family. But if you really want to make a dent in the world, to, to paraphrase Steve Jobs, boy, people have got, yeah, we, we don't abuse people. I mean, I get people need home time and stuff. And, but if you've got a deadline, you work like crazy and then, you, you know, it takes but if that isn't there, if it's just the checking the, the boxes, how fast does my savings accrue? Uh, how many days do I get off before I get this, that, or the other? And, and, and I'm not downplaying those. We all have to have personal lives that would become stiff. But if those are at the top of the list, he, you know, go get, a, go get a job in a cubicle someplace because we're not going to be where you want to be. Fair enough. And now, free form. Reach out to the audience right now. Give them, as somebody wildly successful, 
What advice would you give somebody young, just starting out, working on their passion, being an artistic one, being it a more of a mechanical engineering computer space? It doesn't really matter what their thing mm -hmm. is. They're starting out wanting to pursue their thing. What advice do you have? Uh, you said the magic words. Doesn't matter what their thing is. There is nothing that you can learn in life that will not be employed by your brain somewhere along the way. I mean, when people think, well, you know, why would I, why would I take uh, history? Why would I take th this, that, or the other? I'm trying to study this. It's the crazy stuff that that where creation comes from. I mean, I. If any time in my life, from what what am I going to say? Maybe four years on up. If if my parents had had friends over and the, the adults had said, "Mark, what do you want to be when you grow up?" I always had an answer. Always. Six months later, it would have been something different. I wanted to be an archaeologist. I wanted to be a paleontologist. I wanted to be a chemist, then a chemical engineer. I wanted to be an animator. I wanted to be a stage performer. I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to be a civil engineer. And I, and I actually ended up being pretty much a bit of all of those. Um, because you can go, if you study one thing and you can go deeper and deeper and deeper than anybody has, narrower and narrower, I think that, uh, you, again, look at Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or Walt Disney. It was bringing disciplines together that, that why, why would you ever mix those? I, I, probably some of the great chefs in the world, right? Ingredients that have never, never been stirred in the, in, the same, in the same pot. And that breadth, uh, and again, I'll refer to David Kelly. He talks about hiring people that are a T deep, but also broad. And it's very easy. It's remarkably easy to get deep. And if you just this, then you're, sh you're shallow at things, but um, be good at one or more things really good, but know something about everything as much as you can. So again, you're going right back to curiosity is the key. Yeah. Yep. Well, Mark, thank you so much. And at this point of the interview, I would like to encourage you, invite you, indeed even nag you to plug yourself grossly horrifically whatever you would like to put out there <laughs> put it out there right now go uh uh i'm a, i'm a, a a crazy fun person to be around uh, anybody who's who uh, you know i'm not that hard to find you want to come by here we'll probably give you a tour it's a really it, it's a I, I was called the other day uh, uh willy wonka with everything but the chocolate we have, we we can make anything else here <laughs> and it's a it's a it's, it's it's a tough environment it's a fun environment uh we change the planet we make people's lives better we have a lot of fun we travel the world nobody builds 200 million dollar water fountains uh out in the middle of the gobi desert they're usually in great cities in great parts of the world with different cultures and we mix that all together and nobody has a five-story slide for water in their backyard. <laughs> True. But for all the things you do have, do you have a website? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, it's 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 www.wetdesign.com. And any other things you want to share? Social media accounts, uh, home addresses, recipes, anything right now. <laughs> you, you know, you can, you can find us on, on Instagram and, and all that stuff. Um, we're we're doing something. Well, I'll, I'll I'll tease it a little bit. Uh, we, we've always thought, gosh, we we've done these big things. Is there some some magic there that we could make small? So we're we're launching hopefully a few of them even by this Christmas. Things for your home or your backyard. We're calling it water magic because there's a touch of magic in everything we do. Uh, some things the size of this cup and some things sort of the size of this table. But you can you can watch for that. And I'm not sure exactly how we'll we'll introduce it to the world, but it's going to come. Now, there goes a man whose entire life is built around art and beauty and the confluence of that and technology. Now, was there a question that you would have wished I had asked, Mark? Just drop it in the comments. I work out at his gym, so I have a ton of opportunities to ask him. Now, as for me, when I'm not at the gym, you can find me at all of my socials, and they are all at Bruce Naxon, so I'm around. Now, next week, a little bit of a departure. We're not going to talk to somebody about their failures. We're going to talk to relationship expert Jana Swan about the failures people make in their dating life. This one's going to help you. Let me worship you. I'll drop everything I'm doing and schedule around you and all of these different. And that energy is just not what attracts people. It actually repels them.